Welcome back to our exploration of the Micro 800. Today we're going to talk about built-in functions. For example, there are numeric functions. The numeric functions are similar to the ones that you would find on a scientific calculator. You'll find things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, powers, exponents, logs, and all the trigonometric functions such as sine, cosine, and even things like arc cosine and arc sine. We'll also talk about the compare functions. This includes functions such as equal, not equal, greater than, greater than or equal to, less than, and less than or equal to. Know that this discussion is very much related to data types. We can mind map this with ideas such as prefix, multiples of 8, such as 8, 16, 32, and 64. And then we had different types such as unsigned, signed, and decimal. You'll recall this table from the textbook where we talked about the bit width of a data type. For example, we have the unsigned short integers with a bit width of 8, all the way to things like the unsigned long integer with bit widths of 64. These unsigned data types will hold values from 0 to 2 to the n minus 1, where n is the bit width. So we see that for 8, it holds from 0. 2 to the 8th, which is 256, minus 1. So that's 255. You've got to remember that minus 1, just like when you're counting. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And if you mess that up, you end up with a off by 1 error. Don't forget the signed data types. For example, the short integer will hold numbers between negative 128 and 127. And we also have the reals. So we have a real that's 32-bit, and then we have a long real that's 64 bits. And you can see how large those decimal numbers can be. I believe we had a discussion where we said it's generally better to use the smallest data type possible to hold your numbers. However, there's good reason to use larger types, such as your double integers or your type reals. With double integers, there's less worry about overflowing or wrapping around. We had an example where we had a clock that was pointing to minute 50, and if we were to add 20 minutes to that, it would now be pointing at not minute 70, but minute 10. Again, that can lead to a host of runtime errors that are difficult to troubleshoot. And by using a large, very large integer value, you don't have to worry about that as much. And of course, if you're using a type real, you don't have to worry about wrapping at all. Let's take a look at the math functions. We have the usual suspects. The trigonometry, and then some others that you may be familiar with, such as negation, truncate, modulo, and random. Most of these operate similar to your calculator, where you have two input functions, such as addition subtraction, multiplication, and division. We also have some that are one input functions. And an example of that would be your sines and cosines. In ladder logic, it looks something like this. So we have an input, we'll let this be real Alice. And we'll let this be a real called Bob. And we'll put those into a box. And we will send them to this built-in function called addition. And then we'll support it in 
the ladder logic like so. This input is called enable, and this output is called enable out. And finally, we have the primary output of this function right here. We'll let that be real called sum. Real sum will be assigned the value of real Alice plus real Bob when the enable line is asserted. Of course, we could put some logic here to say when that does and when that does not happen. Internally, we would see these labeled enable, enable out. We would have input one, input two, and output one. There's a few things I'd like to bring to your attention. First, you could think of the enable out as a direct connection to enable. Just think of it as a wire that goes right through the block. Whatever enable does, enable out will follow. The other thing I'd like to point out is that this memory location is only updated when this rung here evaluates as true. If it helps, you could look at it this way. Inside, we have our worker, and our worker is waiting for the alarm to go off. Right? So as soon as enable is activated, the worker will take the summation of these two and move it to the output. No alarm, which is to say no enable, no work is done. So we will not write to our sum again unless this block here evaluates as true. Tell you what, this is an easily overlooked concept. So I think what we ought to do is explore it with its own ladder diagram. So we'll start with Bob here. We have a reel called Bob, and we have 1.0. So what we're going to do is we are going to add 1 to Bob. And we will store the result in a real sum. We'll let this here be called boolean select. We'll put a second adder here, this time with not select. Here's the real called Bob again, and this time 2.0. And we'll put the result in real sum. The first thing to notice is that select is in both rungs. In the upper rung, we have select. In the lower rung, we have not select. If select evaluates as true, this rung will evaluate as true, which means that Bob plus one will be placed into our sum. If select is not true, this rung will evaluate as true and Bob plus two will be moved into the memory location called our sum. We could write this as an if else statement. So if boolean select our sum is assigned the value of the real Bob plus one. Otherwise, real sum is assigned the value of real Bob plus two. We need to add two terms to our vocabulary. They are overload and extensible. To overload a function is to accept different data types. To be extensible is to accept multiple inputs. Let's explore the overload concept first. We'll start with a memory location, type real by the name of Alice. To Alice, we're going to add the number 2.0. And we'll let the value be stored in a location called R sum. 
Okay, nothing new there. We have a type real. We have 2.0, which is a type real. By the way, don't get 2.0 confused with 2. This is a type real. This is a type integer. They're not the same thing, by the way. That's the symbol right there. Not the same. As far as the overload is concerned, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take the same function. Okay, We're going to take this addition block. And we're going to feed in a double integer called Carol. And we're going to add 2. We'll store the result in a memory location called double integer sum. Now, as far as the term overload is concerned, this is what it means. We have this function called addition. In this instance, it takes a type real. It takes two type reals and provides an output that is a type real. That same function can be overloaded to accept a type double integer and provide an output of double integer. In fact, the addition function will take almost every single one of those data types. If we were to put that into words, we would say same function, different data types. Again, these are the same functions, but they will operate with different data types. In this case, it was type real, and in this case, it was a double integer. While the function will operate on different data types, that does not mean you can mix and match data types on an individual function. You see here that both inputs are type real, and the output is type real. You cannot change that. For example, if you set this to 2, you would have an error because 2 is not a type real. We see the same thing here, where all the inputs are of the same type, and the output is the same type as the inputs. If you were to set this to 2.0, which is type real, you would have an error. We can now move on to things that are extensible. Extensible. To extend. Consider a rectangular with length, height, and width. The volume is equal to height by length by width. So we have three inputs that need to be multiplied together. You'll find that the multiplication instruction is extensible in that it will take three inputs. So a real called height, a real length, a real width can all be combined in a single instruction for the volume. Again, extensible is to extend. At this point, I want to reiterate a caution to you, and then we'll work a couple examples. So be careful with your enable lines. Consider this code. It looks simple enough. We have this input, which is our global Boolean push button. We also have this variable called double integer count. And you see it's on both sides. So it looks like if the push button is pushed, this will evaluate as true, and double integer count will be incremented by 1 and then stored back into double integer count. You could think of that as a read, modify, and write operation. Unfortunately, this code doesn't do what you think it would do. You would think that if you push the button, it would increment the count by 1. Well, not exactly, because what happens, or what you've forgotten, is that the PLC program scan is occurring many thousands of times per second. And every time it comes through and sees that this line is evaluated as true, 
it will increment count by one. So if you held the push button for one second, the count wouldn't be one, it would be approximately 1,000 because 1,000 program scans have occurred while you've held the button. I'm sure that's not what you're expecting and that's probably not what you wanted. To fix this, we need to give ourselves a little more room. We'll move our push button over here. So global boolean push button. And we will add the R trig function here. I've mentioned this quite a few times. The rising edge trigger will look for that push button press. And when it sees the push button press, it will produce a pulse. That pulse will be high for exactly one program scan. If you wanted to see it, you could even add a coil out here and we'll call it Boolean push button pulse. We can do that because internally the enable and enable output lines are connected together. Just to recap, this is you pushing the button. So global Boolean push button. This is the pulse, Boolean push button pulse. And these are connected together. So whatever happens on the output of our trigger will be seen here as a direct copy. When that pulse occurs, count plus one will be stored in count. Push button is released, nothing happens. Push the button again, and the cycle starts all over. Each time, it's incremented by one. Now that that's out of the way, we can move on to chain operations, where we put multiple functions together. For example, the Fahrenheit temperature is equal to Celsius temperature by 9 fifths plus 32. From algebra, you should remember this. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, which tells us that there's a very particular order of operations. This order of operations is fairly straightforward in the PLC because you have these rungs and each rung is executed sequentially. So if you want something to happen first, it has to be on the upper rung. And then you move on to the other operations. Here is an example. So we start out with a real Celsius and 1.8, which is 9 divided by 5, right? We're going to run that through a multiplier. And we're going to store the output in a memory location real product. Okay, that takes care of this piece. Now we need to take care of the entire piece where we add 32. To do that, we'll take the real product and 32. Now that's 32.0 so that it's real. We'll run that through an adder. And we'll store the output in real Fahrenheit. If you wanted to test this, you could run a number such as negative 40. Negative 40 times 1.8 is negative 72, which means this number here would be negative 72. Negative 72 plus 32 would give you negative 40. You could also test on the number 100. So 100 times 1.8 gives you 180, which means 180 over here. 180 plus 32 will give you 212. We've tested this code at two different temperatures, and it looks like it operates as expected. By the way, I did mention that these were internally connected to each other. And because that's true, that suggests there might be a cleaner way to draw this particular code. 
you could put everything on a single rung. So the first part looks the same. We have our Celsius and we have our 1.8. We run that through a multiplier and the output goes to product. We then take this real product and the number 32.0 and we run that through an adder giving us the result of real Fahrenheit. So same code, same operation as this, except that now everything's on a single rung. And that works because our enable out is a copy of enable in. Let's work another example. In this example, we'll consider the output specifications of a type Bravo and a type Victor output. If you look at the data sheet, you'll find that they are specified as one amp, so 1.0 amps, up to a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. So we have Celsius here, and we have current here. As the temperature increases above 30, you have to derate the output so that by the time you get to 65 degrees Celsius you can only run the PLC at about 300 milliamps of current. If we were to describe this line we would say F is equal to 1.0 if X is less than 30 and negative 0.02 x plus 1.6 or x greater than or equal to 30. That's degrees Celsius. The top part of that piecewise definition describes this piece here. If the temperature is less than 30, the current will be 1 amp. The second describes this piece here. If the temperature is between 30 and 65 degrees, our maximum current is defined by this line. To get started, we are going to compare. We are going to compare the real x with the value of 30.0. We'll do that using a less than function. And we'll send that to a coil called Boolean less than 30. So if the real x is less than 30, this coil will be activated. If less than 30, we want to move 1.0 to memory location real f. Okay, so what that'll do is that'll do this piece right here. We're detecting if the x is less than 30, if the x is less than 30, we are going to move the value of 1.0 amps to a real memory location called f. If not less than 30, we'll perform the calculation describing the line. We'll start with the multiplication. So we'll take our real x and we'll multiply it by negative 0.02 We'll store that in a memory location called intermediate, which is of type real. We'll then take that same memory location. We'll add 1.6 to it and store the value in a real memory location called F. Let's go back and look at our original specifications. So if X is less than 30, so if x is less than 30, we're going to move 1 to f. If x is less than 30, 1 is assigned to f. Okay? And that happens on this rung here. If x is greater than 30, we're going to calculate this equation. Negative 0 0.02 multiplied by x plus 1.6. 
And here it is. The real x is multiplied by negative 0 0.02. That's stored into intermediate value. The intermediate value is then added to 1.6, leaving the real value in f. This lecture wouldn't be complete if we didn't talk about data conversion. And those are the any two x blocks. Let me give you an example to explore this. Suppose you had an integer a and a real called m, and you tried to add them together. What do you think? Can you do this? Can you add an integer to a type real? The answer is no, that will fail because the block will not accept a mismatch of data types. Again, it won't accept an integer and a real. Okay, so that fails. To get out of this situation, you could convert the integer to a type real or the real to a type integer. Let's give that a try. So we have our real, so our type real. We're going to run that into an any to integer. We'll store that value in a memory location called integer m. And then we will do our addition. So our integer a and our integer m. And we'll put this into integer sum. This code will work, but I would question if it's what you really wanted. Now suppose we went up here and initially we have this is value 2 and this is value is 4.7. Well, we know that's not going to work. So we come down here, we still have a value of 4.7. When you do an any to integer, what it'll do is it'll drop the fractional piece. So 4.7 simply becomes 4. So now when we add 2 and 4, you get an answer of 6. Is that what you wanted? Maybe. Probably not, though, so we could actually call this a fail, too. What you need to do instead is back this up, and instead of doing an any to integer, maybe we do an any to real. And instead of running m through here, we run integer a through this block, giving a real a. We take that real a, and our original real m giving us a real sum. So if a was 2, now it becomes 2.0. So 2.0 plus 4.7 gives us 6.7. And that is probably what you were looking to do when you started this. So you got to be careful when you flip back and forth between data types. That's all the material I wanted to cover this evening. However, let's do a quick look ahead. So you remember this operation here where we took a Celsius temperature and we converted it into a Fahrenheit? And we did that using several blocks. So we used a multiplier and an adder. Here they were on two separate rungs. We did the same thing here. Now they were on the same rung. Wouldn't it be nice if we could take that code and make it into its own block. We'll call this block C2F. It has an enable line. It has an enable outline. It has an input for a real Celsius. It has an output for real Fahrenheit. And if we wanted to use it, we could say, here's my local real Celsius, which I send to the real Celsius input on the block. And here we have a local called real Fahrenheit, which accepts the output of the block. Now, wouldn't that be something? You can take this code, you can encapsulate it, you can troubleshoot it, you can make sure it works, you can have a high confidence in it. You can put it into a block called C to F, Celsius to Fahrenheit. And then you could take that block and use it in your programs. You could use it in your program today. You could put it into a library. You can use it in a program a year from now. And you can have high confidence that this thing works. And you don't have to think about it again. 
This is the user defined function block that we keep talking about. It's a way of simplifying your code. It's a way of making your code more robust and in many cases more readable. Certainly more to follow as we continue on with this lecture series.